Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the B&H Virtual Event Space. Happy to welcome in Mr. Bob Davis. Bob, how are you doing today? Doing great. Enjoying this wonderful heat wave. You know, you got to love the change of seasons. I know you're getting it right after we get it here in the Midwest. I, I'm i going to I'm going to play devil's advocate and say I, I don't love this. Heat wave. <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting over here. I know we were talking about it in the green room. You know, I'm kind of like Derek. I'm, I'm trying to keep the AC off and uh, you can't see it in my face right now. But give me give me till the end of this presentation. I'm sure you'll see all the sweat dripping down. <laughs> It'll just make me feel like we're in the Sahara in Africa, you know, waiting for a cheetah to do something. There you go. I'm training. I'm training for for the for the next safari. That's, that's a great way of looking at it. Um, so I do want to thank Bob for being here. I do also want to say thank you to our sponsors over at SanDisk. Uh, unfortunately, our buddy Pete couldn't be here today. He's got, he's got real important things to do. He couldn't hang out with us today. Uh, so we miss him, but we thank him as well as the rest of the team over at SanDisk for sponsoring this event. Uh, for everybody who isn't sure what you're doing here, uh, Bob is going to be talking about the importance of personal projects, uh, talking wildlife and nature. So get excited about that. If you do have any questions related to any of the things that Bob talks about today and discusses, please, by all means, feel free to ask a question. That's what we're here to do is answer some questions. So if you're joining us on Vimeo or Facebook, you can use the comment section and we'll get those questions over to Bob. If you're joining us here on Zoom, you can use the Q&A tab and we'll answer them as well. But without further ado, I don't want to take up any more of Bob's time. So I'm going to hand it over to him and say thanks again for being here. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And anytime I get a chance to share my knowledge and further the passion of the creative arts, uh, photography in particular, I'm happy to do it. I've been super blessed to do this my entire life. This is all I've ever done. So in many respects, you never work a day in your life, but you never work harder than when you work for yourself, but at least it's for yourself. Thank you to SanDisk for having me on. I uh, really appreciate you know, all the support and the honor it is to be a part of the SanDisk Extreme team. So let's jump into this a little bit about me. As I shared, I've been a photographer my whole life. My background's in photojournalism. So visual storytelling is key and I kind of keep that um, thread throughout all of my work meaning you're the eyes for people that can't be there and you want to share the power of photography. And through that power, you can change the course of things, enlighten things, um, change people's attitude towards conservancy with wildlife. We're my, mainly known, my wife and I, Dawn, we have our own business, which we've had full time since 2004, Bob and Dawn Davis Photography and Design. And we focus on high-end events and big weddings and crazy nutty stuff. So, you know, we've been blessed to do a lot of work with Oprah. We've done quite a few celebrity weddings. And to stay fresh, even when I was a photojournalism, I wanna kind of jump to the opposite end of the spectrum. And for me, nature and wildlife has always been kind of like my Zen, a place to go and to just be calm and just relax and just recharge and take it all in. And I found that doing both, complement one another you know weddings are their own wildlife in in their own right you know things are pretty crazy and wild and you have to be prepared for whatever the day throws at you so you wear many hats as as a wedding photographer portrait photographer documentarian part psychologist product photographer commercial photographer you do it all and we roll heavy and we light everything and the opposite spectrum of that with wildlife it's so simple you go out there you do your research, you compose the picture and you wait, wait for the animal, wait for the moment, wait for the light. And I find that so gratifying, but it also keeps you on your toes because wildlife, you can't cue the animals and say, okay, cheetah run, you know, bird, jump off that branch, eagle, get that fish. You know, you just have to be patient and wait and be prepared for those things. Unlike a wedding, they kind of follow you know, uh, a regimented structure. You're going to have getting ready. You're going to have the ceremony and then you're going to have the celebration. So you kind of know what's going to happen. And it's a little bit more predictable within that construct. So personal projects have always been a way to keep that passion alive, to keep that rookie spirit while maintaining your pro's eye. You know, I've been blessed to photograph 
Michael Jordan's entire career. And one of the takeaways I got from that, because I, you know, was kind of an acquaintance, you'd be on the floor with him during practice way before anybody else. And that is you constantly have to practice your skills and your crafts. You know, yes, he could dunk, he could take off, he could do all these amazing feats. But before every game, he would practice the simple stuff, the free throws, dribbling, going around the three point line, you know, because he knew if he set himself up for success in those situations that when it came game time and crunch time, he already made that shot in his mind. So by having personal projects, when you work full time as a photographer, it keeps you sharp, it keeps your skills up. And that's what it is. It's basically practicing and honing in on your craft. So if I can share my screen here, I'll jump in to some of the photographs and some of the things that I wanted to share. And I'm kind of going to jump all around with these photographs. And one thing that I'd like to share with you is consistency. You know, you got to strive for getting it right in camera. And with the technology today, that's ever easy to do because you can create your own custom white balance. You could dial in the exposure. With mirrorless cameras, you could get a live histogram so there's no more shoot and review. You could even see the RGB levels, that's your color levels of a, hint, of a histogram. So for instance, if I pull up this photo, we could see these RGB levels here. And you know, you're looking for that neutral color tone. Uh, with people, you're looking for a neutral flesh tone. And this histogram is the same on the back of your camera as it is throughout the entire editing process. So the better you can get in camera, the better your output results will be. You know, and I'm, I'm still a big fan of printing. For me, it's, it's not a photograph until you print it. So, you know, we print for our clients, we print our wildlife, we have a fine print site. So that really, brings this technology and this quality together is where the proof is in the print. You could really see it there. So let's jump back out here. And again, if you guys have any questions, please feel free, jump in, let me know. Uh, one of the big things that I've carried over from my photojournalism career into everything, into wildlife, into weddings and events, is having a secondary point of view. A lot of videographers do that. They'll set up two, three cameras that are remote, they let them roll, and then they edit it all together on the back end. I do it a little bit differently, meaning I use a remote camera to get a different point of view. And I'll also use a remote camera to capture a simultaneous moment, but at a different point of view. So here's a quick example of setting up a remote camera in one of our venues. So this happens to be in a technical loft at the Four Seasons Hotel in Chicago. And it's this little trap door that opens up. And I placed this remote camera up here, which at this point it was 5D Mark IV. I set my settings and then I let it go auto ISO. I dial in the exact color temperature because by the time we start photographing in here, it's all tungsten light and I can't time my flashes into this. So we dial in the Kelvin down to about 2,900 degrees. Less work on the back end. I'm using pocket wizards to fire the camera. And you can see I have an AC port right here. So I've actually plugged the camera in and I've also plugged in the pocket wizard so I could turn it on at the beginning of the day and not worry about remembering to go back up and turn on the remote. It's just set and ready to go. And we don't have to worry about the power. So this receiver will fire at the exact same time that I take a photograph with my live camera. So I'm down here on the floor photographing and it's capturing a remote view simultaneously. So here's a photograph that I captured of the Hora on the dance floor. And here's the exact same moment from an elevated point of view. So I love doing this, right? Because then it gives you that opportunity to see a different perspective and a different point of view. And it just increases your versatility and the amount of variety for photographs you can give to the client or for yourself. Here I'm setting up a remote camera that's going to be backstage. This was at a gala and it was going to be Catherine McPhee singing to the crowd. And I wanted that backlit shot of her singing, the spotlights on her, simultaneously photographing from the front. So I love using remote cameras. Here's 
here's a photograph. I'll take away all the metadata here just so you could get a nice full view of it. On Safari, we lead photographic safaris. In fact, we have a workshop coming up, which I'll share towards the end of this. Myself and Scott Bourne, we're going to Bosque del Apache to photograph the great migration of sandhill cranes. It's a spectacular sight. But anyways, this is a remote camera down low at a watering hole that is being shot simultaneously while I'm photographing with this separate camera across the watering hole. So you get the idea of what remote cameras can do. I'm just going to pop around here. And if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Otherwise, I could just ramble on. This is from an engagement session. And I'm looking for that different point of view. And we, the couple wanted to do a romantic taxi cab ride. And I'm like, well, that's cool. I'm in the front seat of the taxi cab taking photographs. I've got a flash in the car. And that's being fired from the remote camera. So I'm using the pocket wizard in the front seat. And here's the actual setup to photograph the 1DX that is got three suction cup mounts on the back of the taxi cab with the pocket wizard, with the Canon wireless transmitter in the hot sheet. So when I hit the transmitter in the front seat, it fires this camera to get the different perspective and different point of view while also popping the lights inside the taxi cab. Because if we didn't have any light inside the cab, we wouldn't see the subject at all. And just a point of reference here, I did use a polarizer filter over the lens to minimize as much of the reflections of the street lights and to eliminate a lot of glare so that we could see through the back window. So that's, that's the setup of the camera for a different point of view. Wildlife, as I said, I love wildlife and nature. That's, that's truly my Zen. And when you're out there, again, you just have to compose the picture and wait and set yourself up for success. This is, this is a live image, meaning I'm photographing it live from our vehicle. I'm using you know, a 600 millimeter lens, and this is with the 1DX Mark II. And we're gonna to touch on ISO here a little bit. A lot of folks I know are just still hesitant to take that ISO wherever they need to be to accomplish the photograph they need to get. So if you're photographing a cheetah, it's going to be extremely fast. You never know when it's going to get up and burst. So this is just as this cheetah is about to pounce. You could see it's totally elevated off its front paws. So in order to accomplish that, you're going to be at a super fast shutter speed, 2,500th of a second and up, right? I wanted a little bit of depth of field. So we have eyes to nose and focus. So I chose an aperture of 7.1. There's very minimal depth of field with the super telephoto lens. To accomplish those settings, the 7.1 at 2,500, I didn't care. I took the ISO up to 6,400. But you know what? If you expose it properly, there is no noise. Don't worry about noise. Don't get all in your head about the ISO has got to be low. Now I'm using the latest mirrorless cameras, the Canon EOS R5 and R3, and the files are even better than this. So this has no noise reduction on it. In fact, I don't know if Zoom allows it. There's a nice texture in the background here. That is the actual noise in the frame. But within the subject here, it's super clean. The highlights are great. The shadows are great. You know, and that's what I mean. But if you expose properly for the tones that you want to expose for, let the shadows fall where they may and don't blow out your highlights. You're going to get a great, great quality photograph. So let's pop back out here. Um, here, I'll just keep with the cheetahs here really quick. So we stayed with these cheetahs for a couple of days. It takes time to get the animal in their natural habitat and to get their behavior and to witness that unfolding. So this mother cheetah was teaching her adolescent cubs, three boys, how to hunt. So she had stunned this impala. And then as it was waking up, the male cheetahs had to figure out what to do. She gave them the example, she stunned it, but she's teaching them to hunt. So it's rare that you could witness this type of behavior in the wild. And again, while staying with these a coalition of cheetahs, we found them 
stalking a giraffe and this giraffe had just given birth. Now, had those cubs been accomplished hunters, this giraffe would have been lunch. But the mother giraffe was successful in fending off the mother cheetah because the cubs were just totally intimidated and afraid, rightfully so, of this giraffe. She swung her club, you know, just like a driver would on, on a golf club. And the animals know in the wild that injury most certainly could mean death. So what was so impressive to me was within an hour, she defended this cub, her, her baby giraffe. This mother cheetah tried for an hour after the birth to get this giraffe, but the mother kept her at bay long enough for this baby giraffe to get up enough strength and to run full sprint and full out. And we kept an eye on this baby giraffe. And after a week, we learned it, it survived. It kept its strength. And the mom was really diligent in protecting that baby giraffe. So that's what I mean. You got to stick with something and let the story unfold. Here's the uh, previous photograph of the mother actually running down this impala. And it's amazing to witness. Now we're in a Jeep parallel about 100 yards away, moving over land, and I'm hand holding the 600 with the image stabilization active, and of course the fast shutter speed, 32 hundredth of a second. I cut back on the aperture a little bit just to lower the ISO, but still it's 3200 and incredible, right? Just incredible. And the privilege to be able to witness this. Now we can go out to photograph wildlife, whether it's in your backyard, at the local forest preserve or on safari. Respect nature, respect wildlife. If we were too close and this mother cheetah expended all this energy and didn't be successful in her hunt, you know, it could, it could lead to starvation because who knew when the next opportunity could arrive for this animal to hunt. So work with credible guides when you go on trips like this, respect the wildlife, stay as far back as possible. So this is cropped in about 50% because with the 600 over a hundred yards away, they're still a little bit small. So this is cropped in a good 50% to get this image, but cropping is what it takes to pull in the impact of the image. And that's exactly what you want to do. So I just want to pop back out here for a second and see uh, if there's any questions. I got I see there's a few in the, in the chat here. Um, what kind of processing topaz do I do? We'll talk about that here in a second. And which is the line sites would you recommend to display my photos for possible sales? Um, I'm using art storefronts and I like them because it's a, a great platform for teaching you how to market. What I've learned is that it doesn't matter how great the photographs are, if people can't see them. And so marketing is the key there and learn as much as you can about marketing. I'm gonna go back to sharing the screen and I'll go here, desktop two. Uh, so really, really quickly, just to interrupt, yeah. um, Mark, Mark did have a question related to uh, ISO. Uh, can you explain your usage of ISO? For sure, for sure. So, um, Let's pick another photograph here that's relatively IS, high ISO. And this is a recent trip. I led a, I'll call it a bear safari up to the Northern woods in Minnesota. So here you're in the woods. I like it when it's a little overcast because the bears are so dark. And when it's bright sunlight, you get these really hot highlights. So you have a wide dynamic range. And that means you have to do a little bit more processing in the post by opening up shadows. But here the clouds came over and it gave us that nice cloudy bright sky. We're hand holding, right? Because you can't uh, be immobile in the forest because this bear was about, I don't know, 50 yards away. It's a big mother bear and these are her spring cubs and I'm hand holding. So even though the cameras have in-body image stabilization, the lens has image stabilization if you introduce any movement, meaning I get excited and I mash the shutter, or I'm moving to capture this image, or I'm backing up because I wanna remain a safe distance away from the subjects, 
well, then we got to have a fast shutter speed, no matter what the IBIS is. Because in body image stabilization, you still have to be steady and squeeze. So there is no monopod, no tripod out here. Because again, we want to respect the wildlife. So I know I wanted to be at 800 to a thousandth of a second because the bears, the cubs actually fly up those trees rather fast. They can climb a tree faster than a cat. The mother bear teaches them that for safety. So there was a large male bear that we could hear coming through the forest. So I set my camera between 800 and a thousand of a second on the shutter speed. This is the 100 to 500. So at 500, right, we're going to be at aperture 71. So I know I'm going to need a high ISO. So I chose 5,000 ISO. So that way I could keep my shutter speed high enough that I could be steady. And also the faster the shutter speed, the sharper your images are going to be. So this is an image at 5,000 ISO. Now I'm exposing for the midtones here. The trees are a perfect 18% gray. So I'm manual, meaning same light, same exposure. The light wasn't changing, it was cloudy bright. So once you're dialed in, you don't need to be worrying. Like even if it's a little bit brighter over there and a little bit darker over here, the tones are gonna fall where they should fall appropriately. If you're in aperture priority, then my shutter speed is gonna be all over the place. If I'm in auto ISO and I shoot really tight on this mother bear, we'll go to this photograph, right? This tight face, all of a sudden the camera's gonna wanna open up and brighten because the dominant subject is a dark tone within the frame. So then the ISO is gonna go up and we're gonna get really muddy blacks. Sure, you could fix it in post, but why not get it right the first time? So that's why same light, same exposure, to borrow a phrase from a colleague of mine, Charles Glatzer, Chaz, and he's been on B&H lot. He's a Canon explorer of light and his primary focus is wildlife. And mine is weddings and events, but to stay fresh, I migrate. And that's probably gonna be the direction I'm gonna go once I retire from weddings and events. But sticking with ISO, as long as you expose properly, meaning you're not two stops to the right overexposing or two stops underexposing, you're gonna great tones and no noise. So here's 100% zoom. There is no noise in the darks. There is no, you know, we'll zoom in, you know, 300% here on the bears, clean, 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 clean files, right? So that's what's key with your ISO is you want to get your exposure dialed in. Now I do expose slightly to the right, but I don't use it as a crutch. I'm not going two stops to the right to make sure there's shadows. Remember, zero is zero. I don't care what camera you use. If there's no information in the shadow or the dark tones and you start brightening it up or uh, increasing shadow detail, you're gonna introduce digital noise and that's where it comes from. So it's, it comes back to my foundation in photojournalism where we used to use a lot of chrome, color slide film, to where you had zero latitude. If you were overexposed, the highlights were gone. If you were underexposed, you couldn't bring the detail back in the darks. Today's technology with a live histogram, there's no reason that you can't dial in your exposures. So I hope that answers the question. Um, and while we were out here for these bears, you know, let's, let's touch on a few of these, right? This is again, not afraid about the ISO. This was early, early morning light, beautiful sunlight coming in from the sky. Happened to be lucky enough to see a great gray owl up in the Northern woods. Usually they migrate further North, but he was perched on, a, on this stump and he's hunting. You could tell he's looking at movement in the brush. I didn't turn my head to see what he was looking at, but it was probably a mouse. So I was on a monopod with the 600 and I wanted a good clean shot. So I already got my safe shot, so to speak, at the higher ISO, higher shutter speed. So I took that chance because he was perched there for quite a while and I went low in my ISO and I went low in the shutter speed to accommodate the settings. And I chose aperture F4 wide open to really get that bokeh in the background. But as you can see, there really isn't any difference in this shot at 200 ISO than there is at this shot at 1250 ISO 
or this shot at 5,000 ISO. The images are very clean in all the cameras today. The latest technology with mirrorless cameras can accomplish this, but it still goes back to that foundation of proper exposure and exposing for the tones that you want. The camera meter is just a suggestion, right? And it's gonna average out the scene. But my priority here is to make sure we have yes, detail in the dark tones, but still retain that richness, right? So you wanna meter off it. You could spot meter if you chose to right off the bear and then go spot maybe minus one and a half to keep the dark tones or spot meter right off the tree and set your meter right on the tree. That's 18% gray and set it and leave it. Same light, same exposure. Talking about remote cameras and I'll flip over to the other camera here and show you how I set this up. There was a creek in this area that had a log going across it. And I had seen in my peripheral vision, bears crossing the creek. Well, if I'm over here <laughs> photographing the mother bear and her cubs, I can't be over there to get that shot of the bear going across the log. I did go sit over there for about an hour. And of course, no bear across the log. So if you shoot with two eyes open, you set up a remote. Then every time I take a picture with my live camera, no matter where I'm looking and focusing, this is just going to shoot. So that increases my odds, whether there's a bear there or not. And yes, I did get a lot of, we'll call them junk frames, like you see here. So the images, there's no bear. But then you, excuse me, you get lucky and you'll get a shot with a bear crossing the log. Uh, let me see if I put one in here. But I did get the shot of the bears crossing the logs. Um, let me pull that up real quick. Just, I don't want you to take my word for it. There's my light room catalog. It's in my light room. Um, I see there's a couple more questions. If you want to throw them at me while I'm opening this, be happy to take them. You got it. Now, Ted wanted to know, um, what AF zone size do you use for something like the bear? Sure. Great question on AF zone. So um, when I switch to the other camera over here, I'm going to go through that a little bit. But what I do is I have on all my cameras that are set up the same, whether it's the R5 or the R3. So I have the asterisk button set on here that I will cycle through a precision point, a five point, the center box that I can move around or eye tracking, and it'll cycle through all of those. So depending on what the animal is doing, I can quickly go through that. And I do that for event photography as well. So if I'm in a situation where I like the mother bear and I can't see the face, well, then I'm gonna put the zone bracket, right? because I don't want it looking for highlights. Because even though you might have eye tracking active, it still works off of highlights. And if it can't find a face or an eye, it might jump to the tree because that's the brightest tone in the space. So here we go. Here's the, uh, let's pull these up, right? So here's the shot of the um, remote, from the remote camera of the log. Now here's the bear going across it, right? And these are not toned yet. These are still raw. I'm still working on this project. And I saw that out of my peripheral vision. And here's the cubs following along, right? So that's my remote camera capturing that, you know, because I wasn't there live. Now, the second day I was there, I set the camera for a wider, you know, so I could take in more of the environment. We were up there for three days, right? Never once though, I was hoping for a bear to walk across this closer log, but I wasn't lucky enough to get that, right? But I was able, here's one that's toned. So you get the idea of what can be done with your remote cameras, which is just increasing your odds for productivity and different point of view. So let's go to where I set that up, the remote camera. So I was using a platypod, and I'll show you how I set this up on the other camera with the platy ball head because it's super easy to level it. I strapped it to a tree so I didn't have to worry about leaving a remote out there. Bears are super curious as most animals are. And if it was on a tripod, 
they might go over and knock the tripod or grab the camera and walk away with it. But a tree, they're kind of used to seeing what that is. And again, the advancement in technology, the camera's in silent mode, right? Boom. I pre-focused out there. You know, I set my sh shutter speed at 200th of a second because they're not going to run across that log. They're walking. Aperture 8. And I let the ISO go auto because on this day, the light was changing between sunny and cloudy, sunny and cloudy, and it's a remote camera. So I'm using Pocket Wizard Plus 4s now, and I'm using that as the receiver, their transceivers, and I plug the cable into the R5, and I chose the R5 for the remote camera because it's a 45 megapixel sensor. And if I wanna crop in on any of those images, it gives me a more latitude and a nice beefy file. I'm using an L bracket so that I can have the um, platy plate mounted to the tree with the strap and be right on the side of the camera because the ball head only moves a certain degree, right? So we wanted to set that up. Here's the transceiver that sits on top of my live camera. And every time I take a photo, it fires the remote camera. So like I said, you have to do a lot of editing and junk files, but it's worth it when you get that one shot, right? Catch a drink here. So I'm going to quickly run through a few of these as I, as I shared. Um, maybe we could put this in the link. I have a workshop coming up to Bosque Delapache. This is going to be the last week of November, first week of December. And it's just an amazing thing to witness and to see the, this blast off. So here's what happens at sunrise. You have tens of thousands of birds. It's like someone blows a whistle and cues them, blast off. And they're blasting off to go out to the fields after roosting in the water overnight. They'll fly in, thousands of them. They'll roost in the water. And they roost in the water for safety. And there's safety in numbers. Because there's, there's bobcats here. There's coyotes out here. There's wolves out here. There's mountain lions out here. So in the water, and there's safety in numbers. But just as the sun starts to rise, they do this amazing blast off. And they'll fly around. So it's just an amazing place to witness this, this activity. Here's again, using remote camera for a wide shot point of view, right? I just have it clamped to my tripod because I'm photographing with the 600 to get a tight shot of the birds as they're uh, flying off in great mass. And then I look for those storytelling elements. Once the birds fly off into the fields, they're grazing and they leave uh, corn and soybeans and stuff in this wildlife sanctuary for them to feed on. Then you can park yourself there and hang out all afternoon and get great close-up shots like this. So this is a 600 millimeter lens with the 2X. So it's 2,000th of a second, because even though I'm on the monopod, I want to minimize any motion that I might introduce. So I want it to be sharp and still. And then if this bird decides to run and take off, right, we're going to have a sharp photograph. There you go. This is at 1,200 millimeters, and he's running to get his takeoff. If I took a chance and kept that shutter speed down low, and I'm trying to react, turn it up, we'll miss the moment. So here's the run. And then there you go, you stay with them. Here's the launch. Now for these, we'll talk about focus again. Here, if it's kind of a portrait situation, you could go with eye tracking, right? And it's a clean background, not a lot of distracting elements. As that crane started walking in toward the masses of other birds, I didn't want the eye tracking jumping back and forth to other birds that might be in the vicinity. So here I went to the zone. The box, right? And I kept moving that with the touch pad on the back of the camera to keep that box right on there. And then you could activate eye tracking within that square. So now it's going to track only what is within that box. And I was able to keep it right on the eye from approach to takeoff through flight. Now, when birds are flying in at me, I quickly hit that a, the asterisk button and it cycles through to my eye tracking. And there you go. It, it just perfectly tracks. It's just outstanding what the capabilities are 
for eye focus and tracking. And if you're keeping an eye on my histogram, right? Um, of course, the tones out here are very warm. It's early in the morning. So I do set my white balance manually, meaning I go into Kelvin and I dial it into the warmth that I want. So most of the time when I was outside here, it was 6,000 degrees Kelvin. And if we wanted to do something early, early morning, right? I can take that Kelvin up higher. So this was daylight white balance on the remote camera on my tripod. And then probably we'll look at the time here. Uh, so this was a little bit earlier when birds are flying in. The sun had not come over the horizon yet. I set the Kelvin white balance in camera to 10,000 degrees to give that kind of bland sky a lot of warmth. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, as the sun starts to rise, you go through the pink hues and the warm tones. So you have that control all within camera. And again, you're being ready for opportunity that presents itself. So that while there's a lull in the action in the birds, you look for wildlife. So there were deer. Here's another feisty little bird. One of my favorites is a kestrel, super fast bird. So it's about the size of a robin. And I kind of have this philosophy, smaller the bird, the higher the shutter speed. A raptor, you know, like an eagle, like this shot, you know, you don't have to have that high of a shutter speed. So usually I'm around 2,000, 2,500, 1,600th of a second for eagles because they move slower. But the smaller birds, such as this kestrel, come back down here, like I said, it's about the size of a robin. Well, they're super fast. They cut and they dodge and they weave and their wing beats are super fast. So knowing this, you gotta go at a higher shutter speed. And to accomplish my aperture eight, again, I want from wings to eyes and focus, you have to kick that ISO up. So whatever it takes to accomplish that goal is what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna stop sharing my desk here and we're gonna talk about the remote camera. I'm gonna pop over here, make sure my uh, secondary camera, the R5 didn't go to sleep. Wake it up. And now, while, while, you're, while you're doing that, um, yeah. Ted, Ted did ask um, if you can uh, remind us what the website to register for that Bosque trip is. And uh, if, if you let us know, we can even we can link that in the chat. Yeah, for sure. Um, let me copy the link right here because it's a crazy link like they all are. And I'm going to pop it in the chat. There you go. Excellent. Just in the chat there. All right. So I got my back to the camera. You guys, yeah, you could see me, right? There we go. There you I go. I can hear you. So here's kind of like my remote setup. Whether, again, it's going to be for a wedding, wildlife, a low camera point of view. I absolutely love the platy plate because you could mount it anywhere. It has the mounting straps. You can even put it on a little light stand. And the platy ball is awesome because you can use one hand to maneuver it. And I've got it set super tight so the camera doesn't move. So while it's loosening that, right? Then the ball, I should use my thumb it's stronger. Then the ball head could move any which way. So for those bears, I had it mounted to the side and I couldn't quite get it level with the camera this way because it was bumping up against the tree. So that's why I used an L bracket. So you use Arca Swiss plate on the bottom and then we just tighten this up and then you lock it down, right? So it's locked in place. So depends on what you're going for with your remote. If I'm doing remotes for people, like sometimes I photograph uh, couples arriving to a wedding by carriage and I'll mount this remote camera on the carriage rail. I'll have it for people tracking, not animal, eye and face detection. So if they move about in the carriage, it will track them. Same thing, I will still use the Pocket Wizard Plus 4s. I love the low profile, the newer ones, and I love that they have a hot shoe pass-through. So if I need an on-camera fill flash, I can activate it, and my EL1s will still give me full functionality. Also, for weddings and events, I use the Plus 4s as a backup. Just note that weddings and events, you're communicating with uh, any wireless flash, it's gonna be on 2.4 gigahertz. 
so is everything else in the room. So if you run into communication issues and your wireless flashes won't link up, you need a, a backup plan. And my backup plan are these plus fours. So I could use my flashes off camera, only in manual mode, but you do have four groups. More on that later. So let's stick on firing the camera remotely. So we do need the connection cord that plugs into the R5, R3, even EOS M cameras, whatever cable you need to accomplish that. Plug it right into the plus four. Once this is active, there we go, it's on. On the background, you can see we have four groups, A, B, C, or D. So we could set this camera in one particular group or not set the group at all. So if I'm using four different cameras, I could have one in group A, one in group B, one in group C. Then I could use my primary camera, like I was with those bears. It was the 100 to 500, because it's just a great range. The image stabilization is great. Yeah, you do kind of have a little bit of a drawback being 7.1 aperture at 500. But again, with the power of the ISO, that's almost irrelevant these days because the files are so clean. Now I choose to use the R3 as my handheld walking around camera with this lens because it's a smaller file. So you get better signal to noise ratio. So hence cleaner files at super high ISOs. The R3 files, you know, at 12,800 ISO are much cleaner than a super large uh, 45 megapixel file like the R5. So that's why I choose to use the R3 as my walking around camera. Now this is active. So every time I'll turn the back on and let me change the view of this. So hopefully you can see it blinking. Every time I shoot with this camera, it's firing. Yep, it's firing the R5. So it fires my remote camera, right? So one of the things you want to make sure is that both cameras are in mechanical shutter because as of right now, the um, electronic shutter can be erratic with the remotes. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. So I'm sure Pocket Wizard will figure that out with some type of firmware update. Sometimes they're perfectly synced, sometimes it's not. That's because of the signal from the shoe and the receiving end. So that's my basic setup for a secondary point of view. So let's switch back over here. And I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the camera. How are we doing here? Doing good? Hopefully I'm not uh, gonna run long. I don't wanna get the yank. I figure now we can go to some Q and A. Doing, doing, or, doing great. Uh, doing we, great? We, we, we did get some other questions in. Yeah, um, let's take them. Uh, in if terms not, of we could go through more photos. Yeah, we definitely have time for more photos, but uh, we'll address these first. Um, in terms of, you know, you mentioned you use the Platypod. Um, do you ever use a monopod? And if you do use a monopod, is it typically with a head, without a head? How do you feel about that? You know, do you feel the head is necessary? Excellent question. Um, if I'm, no, I'm going to be like with the bears, right? Because they're, they're dark tone subjects. So I'll bring them up while I'm talking about them. Um, and I'm going out for a specific thing, like the, the owl. I was using the 600, the 600 F4. Now, even though the new version 600 F4 is very light, it's six and a half pounds, you can handhold it, but you can't hold, I can't handhold it for an extended period of time. Meaning I'm watching this owl, watching this owl, watching this owl, looking for those storytelling moments, or if it spreads its wings and takes off and pounces, I wanna be ready for that. So I'm going to keep my eye to the viewfinder because he who moves his eye away from the viewfinder misses the shot. So therefore I use a monopod. And on the monopod, I like to use a tilter head that allows you to tilt forward and backwards because then you have this mobility. If I'm down on my knee, which I was because I wanted to keep a very low profile, you know, when you're walking towards birds, don't look at them, kind of walk sideways and walk slow and stay small. That's why I didn't spook this great gray owl. And I was able to get close enough for these photographs with the 600 millimeter lens. So then I stayed low, but then you can move forward and backwards and move your lens without getting that big cringe if you have it on a monopod without the tilter head, then you get this extreme angle because the monopod is very rigid. Giving that tilt head gives you more flexibility. 
I've even used the monopod with the tilt head in the Jeep for the safari in Africa, because there are times when you're stationary and things are happening, you wanna keep your eye to the viewfinder. Um, pop this image up over here, where it's up toward the top. This guy here, the lilac breasted roller, you know, it was sitting on this branch. Just, uh, that's, and, that's oh, I gotta, I, sorry, I gotta get to sharing the desk, right? There we go, thanks, screen share. Um, here we go. The yeah. lilac breasted roller was sitting on this branch. So any bird is going to repeat itself if you don't spook it, whether it's in your backyard or not, they're going to perch on a branch, fly off, catch something, come back and perch if it's a good perch. And if you're still and quiet, they'll repeat this pattern. So I had plenty of photographs of the portrait. Now I wanted the shot of him spreading his wings because that's when you could see all the colors and just as he burst off. So that means you're constantly keeping your eye to the viewfinder, and that's where the monopod is invaluable. Or if you're in a space where um, you could accommodate it, like with eagles and things along a river or uh, these pelicans and things, I will use the tripod, right? So for this shot, I'm photographing pelicans and rapids up at the Canadian border with Minnesota. So... I used a tripod because then it could be ultra steady. I could switch between video and stills and I could go to an extreme slow shutter speed to show the blur in the water. A monopod would not allow me to do this because I'd still get a bit of that back and forth motion. I couldn't be at one eighth of a second to allow the motion of the rapids. Now the Pelican held still, right? So it worked out amazingly well. He's holding still watching for fish and you want to convey that motion of the water. So that's why I chose to use the tripod in this situation, right? Here I'm handheld. I was able to find an elevated position up on some rocks and the pelicans would fly up the rapids, land, because they have to paddle like crazy to keep their headway in the water. And then when they get tired, they would drift down to the lake that this rapid fed into. And then he'd repeat that process again. So I was scouting around, looking around, like, oh, wouldn't it be amazing if we could see the pelican flying from above? And there was an outcropping of rocks that we could get to. And this is handheld and panning with the pelican. You know, here's, here's another vantage point where you're using a tripod for stability to use and capture landscape photographs. But we needed the tripod to choose a low shutter speed to convey that motion in the water. So I use both, right tool for the right job. And I happen to love pro media gear. I know you guys carry pro media gear. Um, I, I was a user of pro media gear long before they invited me to become an ambassador. And in fact, that's that's the same way I became a part of the Sandisk team is I believe in using a product, learning the product, and if it works for you and it performs and it doesn't get in the way of you capturing the photograph, then that's an excellent product, whatever it may be. And then I'm happy to work with them. Pocket Wizard, you know, maybe someday I could be a Pocket Wizard ambassador, but I've been using Pocket Wizards since 1992 when I was photographing, you know, the Chicago Bulls, Michael Jordan, and I'd have a remote camera underneath the basket. So time for a few more questions. Oh, we're, getting, we're running right up against the clock. So we got, we got time. Don't worry. No need to rush, Bob. We're not oh, going to. You scared me at the beginning uh, there. That I was gonna, <laughs> that Danny was going to give me the hook and <laughs> right off. No, we're not going to yank you out of here. We, we, we like, we like what you're talking about, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, if you don't, that we, you got to be concerned. Now, <laughs> Sydney wanted to know, um, just a little bit more of a technical question. Yeah. Um, she's getting extreme noise at ISO 6400, trying to capture birds in flight using her Canon EOS R. Uh, she's using a 1.4 extender, extender with the RF 100 to 400 f8. So basically, comes out to be an f11. Sure. Uh, 
if she's got to increase her ES, uh, ESO, geez, Bob, I think this heat is getting to me finally. I hear you. Uh, <laughs> if she's got to increase her ISO to get a faster shutter speed, uh, Canon said that she's using the wrong setting, but why would she be getting more noise using those settings if the mirrorless cameras are capable of capturing much cleaner images at higher ISOs? Um, it, you know, I can only theorize on it without actually seeing the photograph and the file. Hopefully, she's doing what I'm suggesting, meaning properly exposing, not just uh, using, you know, whatever the meter suggests, and it's underexposed, and you're having to brighten the image quite a bit. You will introduce noise there. Black is black, right? Zero is zero. So if there's very little to no information there, and the minute you um, brighten that area, you are introducing digital noise because you're trying to put something where there is very little detail. I use the EOS R for years with that same setup and I didn't have any issues with noise. But again, I'm always thinking about the tones that I want to expose for. Let me see if I have, I don't know if I have any, uh, uh, this Safari was an R. Um, and here you go. I mean, this is even worse. Here's a, here's a Mark IV, 1D Mark IV, you know, 800. Uh, those cameras, you really didn't want to take that high in the ISO. But again, if you're exposing properly, oh, this is with an R, but that's a low ISO because this is with um, multiple exposures stitched together. So what I suggest, and I think this is, this is an R, right? EOS R, here you go. This is 12,000. 800 ISO. Doesn't get any crazier than that. There is no noise reduction in here, right? There is texture, there is some noise, but that is totally acceptable to me. And the only thing I did in Lightroom was add just a little, a smidgen of noise reduction. Um, programs like Topaz Denoise, I think do a far better job because they'll clean up the noise without softening the photograph. And if you also have photographs, which I have had, um, where I'm moving and I'm taking it, even though I'm using the fast shutter speed, so we'll just say a bird in flight like this one, it's, it's blasting off, right? There'll be some times where I'm shooting at a high frame rate, high shutter speed, and you'll catch the IS elements slightly moving. What I mean by that is it'll look like there's some vibration around the eyes or around the wingtips and your shutter speed's high enough and your ISO is on. What you're doing is you're actually freezing the motion of that moving element, especially with the high frame rates at 14, 15, 30 frames per second. Odds are you're going to catch a frame where that element is moving. And that's where Topaz AI Sharpen comes in beautifully. It'll take that little bit of vibration and correct it. I don't think it'll correct an out of focus photograph, but it'll take that motion blur and just, and I've used that oftentimes because the moment I want might be the one where that, where I've captured that vibration at IS. Now there is the school of thought that you could turn the IS off when you're using a super fast shutter speed for birds in flight. The challenge for me is, is when I turn it off, I have a harder time keeping it in the frame because I'm moving up and down. I got this motion going like this and it makes it harder for me to keep it within the frame. So it's that trade-off. If you're usually above 2,000th of a second, it could be an, a better idea to turn image stabilization off. Then you won't catch those floating elements if you're really good at keeping it steady within the frame. Because if you're not, then IS helps keep that image very nice and steady and it allows me better tracking with the photograph. You know, just kind of showing uh, this image here, that's, that's at 1200 millimeters handheld, right? I needed the IS. There's no way I can handhold something at 1200 millimeters and follow focus and keep it within the frame because the most minute movement sends you all over the place.
Yeah. Now, Luke wanted to know if you could possibly just re-explain the megapixel size advantage of the R3 again. He's under the oh, sure. the higher megapixels would give you cleaner files. Sure. Um, first, let me touch on first and foremost is follow your passion, right? Photograph what you love. And whatever tool you happen to have to do that, go for it. With that being said, if you have the opportunity to have two different cameras, I geek out on the technical stuff because I exploit the technology, right? And reading and learning all the white papers that Canon publishes, I learn that signal to noise ratio, and this is kind of geeky, but don't worry about it. Basically in the simplest forms, the smaller file size, like the 24 megapixel file or the 20 megapixel file of the 1DX Mark III, are cleaner at high ISOs, you know, 12,000, 16,000, whatever the case may be, side by side, I did testing, are cleaner than using the 45 megapixel camera at those high ISOs. So think about it this way, more information, more pixels, you're increasing more noise. So if you're gonna use an R5 or, like a Sony A1 at a high ISO with a lot of megapixels, then I strongly suggest investing in something like Topaz Denoise, because that'll be your friend. Um, with the lower megapixel cameras, I don't find the need to do that. And I find the texture of that noise very, very pleasing. Hope that helps. Awesome. Um, now, another question here. Do you use an extender? All the time. Simple one, easy. But use whatever lens you're using, use their matched extender. Don't, if, if you're, if you got a Canon lens and you put some inexpensive aftermarket extender on it, it's not optically matched. Canon, Sony, Nikon, they all design that extender in mind with the lenses that it's going to form and function with so you're minimizing any loss sure there is there is there, if you're a pixel peeper there is a tinge of difference more on the edges than in the center but if if you're making prints right and it's proper viewing distance you know you don't notice it at all right these are 20 by i mean uh, 16 by 20s and this image is stupid high ISO. This is with the R, with the 100 to 400. And it was after sunset. I'd have to look it up for sure, but I think this one was 25,000 ISO, right? Huh. So yes, there is some digitalness, noise, texture going on in there, but it's nothing like the grain that film used to be. Right. So I, I find it pleasing. You know, it, it doesn't bother me. I, I mean, you can see, you know, in the background, I have wall art of a cheetah and a lion. Here, I'll grab this lion print off the wall. This lion print is 12,800 ISO, right? With the 1DX Mark II. No noise. I mean, sure, there's, I, I kind of call it texture, but it's not unacceptable. I kind of have this philosophy. If, if people are noticing the noise, then the picture isn't good enough. You know, when you ever go to an art gallery or uh, I'm fortunate enough to have the Art Institute here and I go to the print study room and I'm looking at Robert Capra's actual prints that he printed and you see the grain and you see the texture and you see how he obviously burned things nobody's looking at that. They're looking at the content of the photograph and saying, oh, isn't this magnificent? It's because the moment is there. Do whatever it takes to capture the moment. Don't, don't get in your head about, you know, noise and, and the technology you have on the back end to correct any of that stuff is just so supreme now. Yeah. I think, I think you hit it on the head when, you know, you, you mentioned about the, the, the content being there and, and, you know, the, the quality of the image. And I think, you know, you're never the, the, the pixel peepers of the world, if you will, they're, 
that's that's what they're gonna do. They're they're right. gonna, they're gonna peep for those pixels, and they're gonna they're gonna be lost on the beauty of the image to begin with. So you shouldn't be creating for those people. You should be creating for yourself and for the people who are going to appreciate the art. And that's that's ultimately why you should you know pick up a camera in the first place. Right. Right. Yeah. Why zoom in two hundred percent? You can't do that in a gallery, or if you paint a print on the wall. It's that proper viewing distance. Uh, we had a show at the uh, Nature Center here in Chicago, and it was Tom Mangelson's work. I've always admired his work. And it showed his film photographs up to his current work, you know, and at proper viewing distance. I mean, these were these were huge, like three foot by six foot images, prints. And if you're proper viewing distance to take it in, you really couldn't tell the film from the digital. But if you came this close and you start looking at the film, you're like, oh, my God, look at all the grain, you know, and it's soft because film had a, a, a softer quality. Lenses couldn't resolve the image sensor today and, and the lens quality today, today is so sharp. So when you did the same thing to his latest work, where he's using the latest Nikon and the latest lenses, it's so sharp when you get this close, you know, and it, and it holds up much better. But again that appreciation for the art at the proper viewing distance. Oh my God, you can't take anything away from either one of them. There you go. Well, Bob, I want to, I want to say a huge thank you to you. Um, literally Bob went and, and ripped things off of the wall for us. <laughs> so <laughs> I love you. this. I love sharing, you know, and I love getting people excited to get out there and, and do what they love and enjoy and, and do it for yourself. Do it for your heart. Don't worry about the pixel peepers. There you go. I, I I definitely agree with that, and I love that sentiment. I think if if you picked up the camera in the first place uh, to make money, you're probably already off to a bad start. Find the love, find oh, the you're right first, and 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 then worry about the money. The money is oh is 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 secondary. It's a great thing, but you know, make sure you're shooting the the stuff you're passionate about because otherwise, you'll put the camera down way quicker than you expect. It's awesome you brought that up. My uncle said that to me when I was in high school. You know, he, he, of course, he wanted me to do something that would guarantee an income, you know, be an engineer, do this. But then he said, you know what? Do what you love, be passionate about it. And if you're really good at it and passionate, the money will come. It just will because people will desire that passion. There you go. The old saying rings true do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. There you so go. True. Well, so, thanks, Scott. I really appreciate it. And thanks, Pete and B and H and Sandisk for, for allowing me to share this. Yeah, our absolute pleasure. We really appreciate you being here, Bob. I, I agree. I want to thank Sandisk for sponsoring this event. And uh Pete, if you rewatch this, hopefully you do. Just know you were you were very sorely missed. And I'm sure that there's going to be lots of of fan mail that comes in that says, Where was Pete? We wanted <laughs> so we'll Bring hopefully. That's it. We'll hopefully see him on the next event. He'll he'll have some free time for us and he'll be uh, joining us again. But Bob, thanks again so much. Everybody thank who you. tuned in and viewed this, uh, thank you as well. That's all the time we have for now. Make sure to catch up with us in a little while. But this has been another edition of the BH Virtual Event Space. We'll catch you next time. Thank you so much.